students today we'll start off with the uh, next set of charts okay so um, we'll start off with something called as cerebrospinal fluid okay so what is cerebrospinal fluid where is it produced so CSF is a clear or a colorless fluid right and where is it formed it is formed basically in the ventricles okay mainly by the uh, produced mainly by the choroid plexus hope you remember your anatomy okay and finally they mm, it's basically what is it it is nothing but an ultra filtrate of plasma it is another form of plasma but an ultra filtrate of that okay so uh, where is it uh, produced it is basically produced by the ventricles the cerebral ventricles okay and it lines it is present everywhere in the spinal canal it is present in the subarachnoid space okay so where is the subarachnoid space basically it is in be between the um, arachnoid which is the external part and the pia mater which is internal so in between that you have the uh, spinal fluid okay or the cerebrospinal fluid right so basically it is present everywhere mainly for lubrication to it acts as a shock shock absorber hmm? so these are the my functions right now let's go into a proper subject okay what is a procedure called when the uh, cerebrospinal fluid is extracted it is nothing but a lumbar puncture okay so what is the most common site involved it is usually um, l3 l4 or l4 l5 Okay, so that is the most common area where uh, lumbar puncture is done right so uh, what is the needle used it is a lumbar puncture needle this is a long needle okay it is very easy to identify a slender needle so that it can easily pass in through the um, ligaments through the dura mater and finally enter into the subarachnoid space okay so uh, for this uh, this remember you can see it is a small it is a long needle but a very thin needle usually what we use is a 22 gauge needle okay so i'm giving you a small assignment here uh, we'll, we'll go later then i'll tell you okay so what is the procedure it is basically the, uh, the patient is lied on one side okay he lies on one side he or she lies on one side on either of the side okay and then uh, you identify the l3 l4 vertebrae or the l4 l5 and gradually you insert the needle under all aseptic precautions okay and then you um, pass through the ligaments and the dura mater and then you enter into the subarachnoid space so how do you know that you have entered the subarachnoid space that there will be a loss of resistance all these things you will learn in detail when you reach medicine but the just 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 a brushing through okay so what i need you i want you to find out is which is the level where spinal cord ends okay where is that level then another thing what is the position used for a lumbar puncture and why they use that position okay so these two you have another assignments coming up but these two are the assignments as of now okay and at the end of the class you send all these assignments together to your mentors right now let's go back so what is the next procedure so this is how a uh, spinal fluid is withdrawn okay so once you reach the um, uh, subarachnoid space you will feel that loss of resistance okay so gradually you will remove the stillet then the first thing what you're doing is you need to identify the pressure what is the cerebrospinal fluid pressure so immediately you attach a manometer okay and then that pressure is called as the opening pressure okay and that opening pressure is expressed as millimeters of water not the normal sphygmomanometer pressure okay that is millimeters of mercury this is millimeters of water okay so uh, that is the initial part then we go gradually this is another picture okay so what all things you're supposed to know where is a csf produced what is the procedure called right and what is the lumbar puncture needle what is how long it is it is 10 centimeters and long and it is 1 to 1.5 centimeters wide right and usually we use 22 gauge needle 
okay and you should know what is the procedure briefly just know what is the procedure so now that you have detected the pressure the next thing is you need to uh, segregate the bottles because you at the end you are sending all these things for investigations right so the first bottle which you use is usually the first few drops is taken for microbiology why because that is it should uh, to avoid or to minimize contamination right because we are using we are why why do we send it for microbiology mainly for culture right to identify the organism to grow the organism so for that you require a, um, a less contaminated specimen then the next one the second tube you usually send it for biochemical and other parameters like a tc or a dc all these things are sent then the third tube that is a third um, third uh, what third part which you are collecting that is sent for cytological processes okay so other further processing so usually the amount collected is between 3 to 5 ml okay you can divide it accordingly depending on each uh, each professor or each doctor has their own style right so usually this is the uh, pattern which is followed the first one usually goes for microbiology the second part usually goes for chemistry either it can be glucose or proteins and the third part uh, comes for uh, tcdc that, that is a uh, total count a differential count and it can also go for cytology right next so what are the indications for a lumbar puncture do you do a lumbar puncture every time no you can't do it right so it is used it is done mainly for you can divide it into two parts one is you have diagnostic purposes and then you have therapeutic purposes diagnosis in the form of the in cases of suspected cases of meningitis or encephalitis or when you're thinking of any any form of malignancy when there is for example if you're thinking of case of leukemia okay so if you are suspecting meningeal involvement or in cases of subarachnoid hemorrhage mm -hmm. but this is usually not the first line of treatment but it can still be done okay and other inflammatory conditions like in cases of increased proteins that is in case of gamma globin or in cases when you are suspecting a neoplasm of the central nervous system right so these are the general diagnostic indications for lumbar puncture so you have therapeutic indications also one is to reduce the cerebrospinal pressure the fluid pressure to reduce the pressure why usually that is done in a very controlled manner okay and then as you know as you all know okay the spinal anesthesia how spinal anesthesia gun given it is given in the same manner so basically you are administering medications okay then uh, to introduce any contrast suppose you want a radiographical contrast you can introduce it through the spinal also but that is less less used these days because of the complications now what all things now that you have got a fluid now what all things you will examine okay so first thing is you have to look for the pressure as i told you you attach a manometer and you look for the pressure then appearance of the fluid is very very important how is the fluid whether it is a clear fluid whether it is a turbid fluid whether it is bloody fluid or uh, whether it is uh, any uh, other color change okay all these things are important then you do a total count and a differential count right then you go for chemical examinations you go for glucose and proteins okay and and then microbiology and finally you go for cytological okay and if you require any special investigations you can go for special investigations also right now let's see what are the complications of lumbar puncture so the usual complication is post puncture headache okay that is a usual complication that we encounter okay and you can introduce infections which is very 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 uh, uh, a severe complication if you do not practice proper aseptic techniques then you can definitely have complications okay then uh, you can have subdural hematoma right failure to obtain csf this is a called a dry tap okay this can be because of incorrect positioning or because uh, there is some kind of a spinal block right and there can be brain herniation or that is called as coning 
okay when there is increased csf pressure right so when the pressure increases what happens that is herniation of the uh, contents herniation of the brain contents or the spinal uh, cord contents so these are generally the complications of lumbar puncture you should know all these things you should know the indications right what are the complications what are the contraindications what is the composition of csf all these things are very important for you right now what are the contraindications when will you not do a lumbar puncture when there is raised intracranial pressure when you have cardio respiratory compromise or any form of bleeding diathesis or any form of local infection at that particular site you will not do a lumbar puncture okay now now that you have csf in hand now what all things you should do you should examine csf immediately there should not be a delay in csf examination okay so if you get the sample immediately within 30 minutes the report should be done okay so if there is a delay what have what will happen usually it is a cell count and the glucose concentration that is affected okay so uh, and you know that lumbar puncture it is not easy to repeat and it is not a good option so whatever fluid you get you have to do it immediately without any delay okay and because this is a very sensitive investigation you require proper accuracy also right now first uh, i told you the pressure right what is the normal opening pressure it is around 60 to 80 mm of water remember it is water not mercury okay then color is important then you look for the clarity any clot formation grossly this is what you will examine okay if you get a if you get a csf sample these these are the things you will examine that is a color is important what the clarity is important and any form of clot formation okay right now how will you compare the color ideally csf is colorless okay it is compared with that of the distal water any color is abnormal whatever be the color it is abnormal if you get a color okay most common cause for an abnormal color is usually blood it is mainly because of a traumatic tap okay or it can be because of subarachnoid hemorrhage so how will you differentiate between the two it is easy to differentiate there is nothing much okay so if it is a traumatic tap what happens the initial flu few sorry initial few um taps that is initial few ml will be a blood stain okay if it is uh, and the latter half will be clear okay or if it is subarachnoid hemorrhage throughout you will get a similarly bloody tap okay and another uh, test how you will differentiate it is you just have to centrifuge the sample okay so when you centrifuge the sample if there is uh, if it is a traumatic tap what happens rbcs will settle and you will have a clear fluid on top right or if it is subarachnoid hemorrhage then what happens this is nothing if when you centrifuge you will get a, a pink fluid or a yellow fluid okay because that is long standing long standing cases i mean it's it's actually blend with the uh, csf so there is a pigment formation called as xanthochromia okay so that's why you will have a pink or a yellow color okay so this is the normal clear a is the clear csf sample b is a bloody tap okay c is when you have a bloody tap actually okay can you see that they can you appreciate that the rbcs are settling down right this part is the rbc settling down and you have a clear fluid on top and here if this if you can appreciate this part this is the uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage wherein you can see that the upper upper portion is pink in color right or pink or light red in color and lower part you have the rbcs which is settled so that is already um, mixed with the plasma all right now um why is that yellow color because i told you because of the pigment called as xanthochromia right so what are the conditions where you will get a yellow color one is in case of deep jaundice it is very important or in cases when you have high protein content or when you have subarachnoid hemorrhage so these are the usual conditions which is associated with a yellow color csf 
right next we'll go for the turbidity okay when do, do, do you get a norm do you get a turbid csf yes you will get when the uh, pus cells or when there is an increase in the cell number okay you will have a turbid csf slight increase of uh, cell number will not be visible with a naked eyes but when the um, cellular content increases when the cell count increases you will get a proper turbid fluid okay now what we have to see is we have to also look for coagulation okay you just leave the sample like that immediately after after all your investigations you leave the sample like that if it coagulates small amount okay fine if if it coagulates right if it coagulates right small amount if it coagulates then that indicates that there is increased fibrinogen content okay and um, what you should know here is this one this part you should remember what is this this is the cobweb appearance cobweb appearance very very typically seen only in tuberculosis okay when you leave that sample for some time there is a cobweb appearance on the um, of the sample above okay so that is a very classical feature seen in tuberculosis tb meningitis okay now what is the normal volume it is 100 to 150 ml i told you opening pressure is 60 to 80 it's 60 to 80 sorry there is a mistake here it is 60 to 80 okay 60 to 80 millimeters of water and um, it is usually clear without any clot this cellular level is important for you should know them okay adults it is usually 0 to 5 cells and infants it is 0 to 30 infancy it is more within 1 to 4 years gradually it will start reducing 0 to 20 and then 5 to 18 it is 0 to 10 okay so that is the normal cellular level in in csf excuse me now what are the other investigations you will do you will do a glucose level a protein level and then you will go for the chloride okay so what is the normal glucose level it is 45 to 80 milligrams per deciliter all right it is basically around 60 percent that of the blood glucose level so before going in for a lumbar puncture ideally you're supposed to take the blood uh, venous blood sample for both for two things one is for glucose and also for proteins you are supposed to take that okay so um, your um, csf glucose is around almost two-third that of the blood glucose that much you should remember okay so and proteins normal proteins in csf is 15 to 45 milligrams okay so here also proteins also you should know proteins is one-third that of the plasma proteins okay chloride level in normal in csf is 120 to 130 milli equivalents per liter and uh, uh, in serum level it is it is actually in uh, in the serum it is 20 um, milli equivalents which is uh, more than that of the um, csf level okay so what you should not do First and foremost, you should not delay investigations beyond 60 minutes. Never use a glass tube because cells will adhere to the glass. Always take venous samples before. Okay. For both uh, proteins and glucose, I told you earlier, you need to compare it with the peripheral uh, glucose and proteins. Okay. And if there is a delay, you can refrigerate the sample for culture, but not for the rest of the investigations okay right now there is something called as pleocytosis what is pleocytosis it is nothing but an increase in the cell count in csf is called as pleocytosis right we told you that immediately you have to examine the um, blood sample right oh, sorry the csf sample right so you always start with the uh, opening pressure then you have the appearance and then you go on for further investigations whether the sample is turbid or whether it is clear right whatever it is then you your next procedure is if the sample is clear 
you don't have to do a much of a dilution if it is turbid then you have to dilute it with turks fluid you remember turks fluid yeah the same turks fluid is used here also okay and instead of a, a new bar normal new bar chamber you have some proved new bar counting chamber or the fuchs rosenthal chamber counting chamber okay that is the one which is normally employed for csf cell count right now what are the causes when you have an increased in the total count you can have in cases of infections especially meningitis intracranial hemorrhage any form of malignant infiltration be it leukemia or lymphoma or introduction of foreign substances what is this foreign substances either it can be in the form of a contrast dye or certain medications which you are giving right all these things can cause an increase in the cell count gullian barr syndrome multiple sclerosis all these things are causes for increased cell count right so if you, if you can appreciate this is the meninges what they are attracting and what is meningitis which is the common manifestation which is a common infection usually involving the pyomata the arachnoid okay so what is meningitis it is usually it can be caused by a viral infection or a virus it can be bacteria or it can even be a fungus which can cause meningitis okay so it is nothing but an infection of the pyomata the arachnoid matter okay and um, csf you know that csf usually surrounds all the uh, brain tissue right now what is important for you is you should differentiate or you need to differentiate three types of meningitis okay bacterial tuberculous and viral meningitis so uh, i will tell you an easy method for you to remember okay so meningitis you know that it can be either bacterial fungal viral or tuberculous right so invariably you should remember that neutrophils are elevated in cases of pyogenic meningitis or in cases of bacterial meningitis okay and fungal meningitis whereas lymphocytes are invariably elevated in cases of viral and tubercular meningitis okay you can have mixed in cases of tb you can have sometimes neutrophils and lymphocytes but usually it is the lymphocytes which is elevated okay and you have a mixed a mixed when you have both neutrophils and lymphocytes elevated in cases of fungal or in case of tb or in cases of bacterial infection okay but usually remember neutrophils are elevated in cases of bacterial infection and lymphocytes are elevated in cases of viral infection so eosinophilia will be present in usually in cases of parasitic infections okay now what is the normal protein level in csf i told you it is 15 to 45 mg right uh, and it is very sensitive but it is not a specific method how will you detect proteins it's usually detected by turbidometric method okay and uh, so when there is contamination or when it when there is a traumatic tap you will have false elevation of proteins okay then you have something called as uh pandi's test <laughs> pandi's test or pandi or whatever that is basically nothing for to determine the globulins which is present okay for that you use phenol the things are not important for you but at least you should know them okay simultaneously at the same time uh, you have to detect the proteins which is present in the peripheral blood also that's why i told you earlier you have to take one hour before the sam before the procedure you're supposed to take peripheral blood for both proteins and for um what was the other one i told you remember remember think and tell me yeah right glucose okay fine so when will you get increased proteins in cases of meningitis spinal cord tumor multiple sclerosis gullian barr syndrome and hemorrhage okay all these conditions you will get an increased proteins in the cerebral spinal fluid right next we'll go to glucose what is the normal glucose in csf i told you no just now we finished all these things you should be telling me i'm no i'm not going to repeat all these things for you okay so remember that here uh, the glucose is 45 to 
80 milligrams normal glucose right so you have to detect glucose immediately why because glucose will get, will get degraded right we know that glycolysis is a repeated process so glucose reduces so it is uh, it is recommended that you detect glucose immediately okay and how do you correlate it with blood glucose it is around two third that of the blood glucose level right and invariably it is reduced in uh, pyogenic uh, infections in cases of tuberculosis why because all these creatures all these organisms they utilize sugars they require sugar right so um, that is another clue for you okay in cases of pyogenic and in cases of tubercular meningitis glucose level will be low but it will be normal in cases of viral meningitis right okay so this is an easy chart for you to remember okay in pyogenic infections or pyogenic meningitis the appearance of the uh, csf will be turbid leukocyte count will be more you will have more number of neutrophils neutrophils will be more here neutrophils will be more proteins are markedly increased there is an increase in proteins sugars will decrease bacteria will utilize all the sugars okay what additional investigations you will do you will do a gram stain right to find out exactly what the organism is you will do a culture and lactic agglutination okay so these are the this is the chart for acute pyogenic or bacterial meningitis next we'll go to tuberculous meningitis again here the color can be it can be clear or it can be cloudy one thing and what is important for you is cobweb cobweb appearance don't forget that cobweb is seen seen in very typically in uh, tb meningitis okay and here uh, remember you can have uh, either a lymphocyte or a neutrophil or both can be elevated and invariably proteins will be elevated okay glucose plus minus definitely it is reduced but not as reduced as bacterial meningitis okay what all additional investigations you will do you will do acid fast bacillus staining okay that is zn staining you will do a culture and then you will do pcr polymerase chain reaction these are the additional investigations you will do for um, tb meningitis when you're suspecting tb meningitis okay then the third one is viral okay let's go to viral here remember the appearance of the uh, fluid is usually clear or it can be cloudy not much but and here remember lymphocytes will be more which will be more and you will have increased protein levels glucose level will be normal okay what additional investigations you will do you will do a pcr to identify the organism now i'll ask you a question what are the no viruses which will cause meningitis you have herpes simplex enterovirus herpes zoster infections right and tuberculosis we know it is mycobacterium tuberculosis pyogenic it can be um, pneumococci meningococci haemophilus or streptococci so these are the general infections general organisms which will cause infections okay so in one chart i have included all these three okay pyogenic tb and viral it is easy for you to remember this way right so um, this is a first chart right um with the positive features positive features i have highlighted in red okay so what is the chart interpret the chart right so how will you interpret the chart here cobweb is absent cellular count is high neutrophils are more so that itself has given you a clue it is acute pyogenic meningitis what is the cause of this condition it is usually bacteria involving what are the organisms involving you have pneumococci meningococci haemophilus streptococci okay other organisms what are the clinical manifestations how do the patient usually present patient presents with fever okay vomiting headache neck stiffness this is the usual clinical features right now next next shot see remember here there is another important clue for you have cobwebs which are present cobweb when cobweb is present it is usually tubercular meningitis very good okay and then you have lymphocytes here lymphocytes predominate lymphocytes predominate right all these are giving you a clue that 
um, you have you are dealing with a TB meningitis. So what is the diagnosis? What are the modes of infection? What are the other tests that will help in your diagnosis? All these things are dealt, right? Then the next one is chart three. Chart three. What is the clue? One thing is sugar. Sugars are normal. Okay, cell type lymphocytes are more. So that will give you a clue that this is viral meningitis. What is the type of organism? What are the other tests that will help? So all these have been dealt. Okay. Now what I want you to do is right. So what I want you to do is this is chart number one. Okay, an eight-year-old boy brought with complaints of fever, vomiting, neck rigidity for one day, and an LP was done. Lumbar puncture was done. Okay, so based on this finding, okay, I want you to write the diagnosis. This is chart number one. What is your diagnosis? Name two investigations which is helpful to confirm the diagnosis. Okay, I won't read it loud. Just look at the. I'll keep it for uh, for half a minute. I think that would be sufficient. Right? Clear? I'll move on. Okay, so what are your questions? What is the diagnosis? Name two investigations which will help to confirm the diagnosis. Right? Fine. Let's go to chart number two. This is chart number two. A ten-year-old girl brought with complaints of fever and vomiting of two days duration. Okay, patient is having fever and vomiting. On examination, she is febrile. She is and there is neck rigidity. Okay, so a lumbar puncture was done, and these are the findings. There is appearance is turbid. Opening pressure is two fifty, protein six fifty, sugars ten, chlorides four hundred. Microscopy shows four hundred cells, and predominant are polymorphs. So, what is the question? What is your diagnosis? What are the causative agents? So, what is the diagnosis, and what are the causative agents? So, this is chart number two. Okay, let's move on to chart number three. A ten-year-old girl. Brought with complaints of fever and vomiting, and on examination again she had uh, febrile and neck rigidity. An L lumbar puncture was done. So these are the findings. Appearance of CSF was clear. Opening pressure is two fifty millimeters of water. Proteins ninety. Sugars eighty. Chloride is four hundred. Microscopy shows hundred cells. And predominant are lymphocytes. So, what is the diagnosis? That's question one. And what are the causative agents? Right. So, you have three charts. Okay. So, at the end, I want you to um, write the answers for these charts plus the other two questions which I asked in between. Okay. I won't repeat the question. Right. 